We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Saul Isaacson Hurst. Saul has spent 10 years coaching in the Premier League Academy with Chelsea and Spurs. He's a one to one coach specialist. His work with my football coach, with a number of players on the books of clubs like Fulham, Spurs, Arsenal, QPR. Aston Villa, Barcelona, and many more. So he's got a huge social media presence. He posts a ton of content. His podcasts are one of my go-to. Uh, absolutely brilliant stuff he, he puts out. He also has an app out for coaches, players, and clubs that we're going to talk a little bit about in the podcast. So lots of stuff to go over here on the development side. Uh, more specifically, what does an individual coach do and why do players need one? We talk about the comparison between England and the US development model. Saul's done a lot of work in both countries. What did the English FA, their DNA, what did that do to individual skill development? We'll talk about creativity and session design. How can we develop creative players? What role do the clubs play? How to communicate with clubs and then how to communicate with players today using different forms of technology. So I hope you enjoy this here. Player development is an area that I'm going to focus on in a number of these upcoming podcasts. So I'm also teaming up with Oliver Gage this month to do an elite player development webinar series. Oliver is the head of performance analysis with Houston Dynamo and the MLS. He's got a fantastic perspective on using a statistical approach, an evidence-based approach to elite development. So on the webinar, he'll use players at MLS and the work he's done. And I'm going to use and share some work that I've done this past season with the Chicago Red Stars and a few players there. So the webinars are on demand, so you can access them at any time. And really, really excited about putting it all together. So like I said, player development, I think it's a it's an overused word. I think it's a misunderstood word when it comes to clubs and, and youth football, and especially moving into elite football and senior football. What are the differences between player development and how can you progress it as the level goes up, as the player goes gets older and all that good stuff. So more information on that is on the modern Modern Soccer Coach Twitter page. Like I said, you can get access to those webinars on demand at any time. So if you missed the first one, which is tomorrow, Tuesday, September 25th, if you miss it, you can still get access to it by registering. So always, always, always love to hear your opinions on this. Player development, skill development, one-to-one -one coaching is a topic that gets a lot of opinion going on social media. So I expect that this here should should get everyone talking and look forward to hearing your thoughts. Really appreciate you listening to the podcast. As always, before you shoot off, please, please, please give it a little review. Five stars on the iTunes page would be very, very helpful. We really appreciate you keeping spreading the word of the podcast. Here's Saul and enjoy. Saul, thanks so much for joining me today for the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Delighted to have you on eventually. Thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to be here. We always kick off these podcasts about talking about philosophies and when I was thinking about that I'm like oh we almost think philosophies are on style of play or tactics or systems but do you have a philosophy on on individual coaching development? Yeah mine I mean that's really it for me it is really an individual based philosophy whether I'm working in a team environment or obviously you know, as you know I'm an individual coach as well and it's very much around supporting players to be explosive and dynamic with the ball and generally about being masters of the ball so it's really around that um you know ball mastery and 1v1 domination and small sided games they've really been the the three key strains of my philosophy when working in clubs and um, we're working in team environments and then when working individually with players really trying to support develop players to be like i said explosive on the ball and challenge their their movement uh, on and around the ball as well so with, with 10 years of coaching experience at big clubs like Chelsea and Spurs, 
what was it or who was it that kind of inspired you to move more towards that uh, philosophy of individual development? Um, I don't know really. I sort of, when I first went into my first role at Spurs, for instance, they had a, a very much a philosophy like I did at the time as well. I was lucky that I'd, I'd learned from Tim Bradbury in America. I was very fortunate. I did most of my, my, my initial coach education there. Came back here and did my FA qualifications with Keith Bryaness, which is amazing. But very much when I first went to America with, with, with uh, Tim, he very much taught me about individual ball mastery and 1v1. And uh, so I was really like a, a bit of a blank slate. So when I went to Tottenham, that's why I, I, I moved up the ranks quite quickly there because they had a philosophy that was similar uh, with John McDermott and Chris Ramsey, which they'd introduced. And it was very much based around 1v1 domination and ball mastery. And so, I mean, the, the whole academy really, especially within the younger age groups, was really about the individual player and technical excellence around that and developing, you know, technically excellent independent uh, decision makers. So, I mean, my philosophy grew around that. I started doing individual, tra individual training as well on the side because it sort of just tied in. <clears throat> and then my reputation grew and it grew within both and I became a skills specialist, if you like. But even within the, the team, the team environment, still work on those, those key aspects, those key teams which are ball mastery one to one domination and and small sided games which is always obviously such a key key part of that as well uh, as i progressed i started working uh as an individual coach as well and took on more clients i worked with a lot of elite players a lot of pro players and then now obviously i work that full time working with uh, pro players and aspiring pro players from all around the world there's so much talk probably since the world cup or during the world cup about this english dna and mm -hmm how they've changed the state of play with the national team and the academy system over the past few years. How much of it has changed in regards to individual development over the past five years? Well, since I started, which is, you know, 12 years or whatever it was again at Tottenham, the academy landscape's changed massively. I think we were, we were very fortunate that we've had, you know, the EPPP, which has really changed um, uh, how academies are organised and become a lot more professional, a lot more accountable, uh, there's been a lot more investment, you know, a lot more staffing. So um, levels have generally risen. And you've seen that in terms of the quality of players that are coming through now. Uh, it's, it's really important. I think the the England DNA is, was, has been really excellent generally in terms of it's been a, a long time coming. I mean, the way they've restructured the uh, the way the youth teams play in terms of the 16s, 17s, 18s and upwards, uh, playing a modern football finally, which we've been calling out for, uh, which a lot of academies are doing anyway. Um, so I've been sort of lucky that these two things have come together and um, and helped us develop a lot a, a young generation of of good players. I mean, there's still a long way to go. Uh, it's still not a perfect environment, but I mean, we, we're fortunate here now. We've got some of the best academies in world football in terms of what they're providing. So we've definitely come a long way. So I'm proud to be associated with those guys. Has the reaction of clubs changed? I mean, I'm. I'm guessing that there would be clubs that would be hesitant, um, whether a few years ago or now, of, of players working with the outside, getting outside support. Has, the, has there been a change or a shift in that? Yeah, you know what? It's for, Look, myself, look, I have clients who play for Barcelona, Arsenal, Tottenham, uh, Fulham. These are first team. These are pro players. You know, and then the academy players from most clubs in London. Clubs don't necessarily like it, especially the academy players. Um the academy teams because they like to control everything which is fair enough you know they like to control everything in their environment so there's not necessarily um not necessarily being embraced with open arms in terms of me working with these young players uh it's interesting some of the smaller clubs um have been a lot more receptive so for instance like clubs like cambridge united i work with a player from there they've been really receptive about me working with players there um so it depends really i still think there's a bit of um an information gap in terms of uh, the the understanding of how beneficial it working individually with players can be. I don't think, like I said, I don't think we really understand it massively and we don't necessarily utilise it as well, uh, which has been great for me in terms of myself because I've, you know, I've developed and now have such a, I'm so fortunate to have such a great uh, portfolio of clients I work with. But I mean, yeah, I, I still, you know, I'm still pushing for uh, for for more people to embrace the, the good work that can go on at working individually with players. Yeah, that's where I'm interested to see if it's going to become a little bit like basketball over here, where 
when players are away, like Kobe Bryant, you know, has his shooting coach and then you go to a different sport, like a, a golfer has their putting coach and you just kind of break your game down into certain aspects. And the more that we, we suppose we get more information on the game and we say a player is technically short, they might not be getting that in their current environment, right? Well, it's interesting, yeah, because I work with, for instance, um, a Premier League first team player who's a current international as well, full international and he came to me in pre-season. He wanted to work on several things, including his defending, but also his 1v1 attacking. So, And he just says, you know, like most of the guys say, just don't get the time to do that individual technical work with a coach within the club. Interesting, I had like a text message today, someone who's, uh, he plays in the conference here, which is one of the, which is like, uh, what's that, the fifth tier of English football. Uh, he, uh, he, he wants to work on um, right foot inside, uh, right foot finding inside pass, first touch to set up a cross or pass, defending them at post, and, and the second phase after a throw-in, that was about, this is a left-back who plays in the conference, they're quite specific. So yeah. it can be really, you know, a mixture of what players want to work on. But that's what I think, you know, you know, if I'm thinking about how I work and my sessions I do individual players, you know, it's really important, as always, to link everything to the game. But for me, it's about trying to break the game down into its smallest parts and work on those specific things and get those things perfected. It's also like, you know, get, breaking the game into microcosmic examples and then, Getting those, getting those uh, things as good as possible, and then taking it back in, and it's very much similar how you know American sports work, like you said about basketball, American football, hockey, and those sorts of things. They break the things down, the individual things down to the smallest bits, and work on them, and then take them back into the game. So, um, as you see, England, you know, they they employed a, a striker coach, you know, and you know psychologists to help with the penalties. I think it's, it's becoming more as we embrace things, and you see that thing Liverpool employing a throwing coach. You know, when you look at it at the elite level, marginal gains are so important. You know, if you can get a little bit extra out of these players and those those little things. I mean, that's why the guys come to me. You know, they want to get a little bit extra. They want to stretch themselves. They want to, a lot of the guys, are, majority of my clients are young pros who are on the border, the cusp of the first team. They want to get that little bit extra and they're always looking for that little bit more. And, they, you know, and I can tell, I think for me, it's about, you know, not telling them what to do. It's about supporting them and challenging them to, get that little bit extra those little marginal gains just might be the difference between a first team start and a, and being on the bench yeah if you ever needed to to get a dose of reality did you see the clip of Andy Gray and Richard Keyes talking about throwing yeah oh, yeah exactly word. I just watched that <laughs> not, but, you know, but that's, this is a problem because this, this sums up perfectly doesn't it it's you know people don't understand things they ridicule, ridicule it as, as you've seen from me are people ridiculing me sometimes on social media what I do you know, even people who work for governing bodies and national organizations. And that's tragic because, you know, if you look uh, you look around the world at uh, the top talent development centers in European football, for instance, you know, individual technical work's a lot more uh, prevalent than, than you see maybe here. But on that then, so like, and that's uh, it's so simple that like, why do we grab, you know, like we grab the Spanish model, we grab the French model, we grab the Germans. But when we say countries that are way ahead of just doing something a little bit outside our comfort zone, we look at it as, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We won't, we won't grab that. We'll grab your tactical plan, but we won't grab your development plan. Well, that's been my frustration here. Because for instance, you know, when I, I first started the, like the youth modules here, I was like shocked that, you know, I had a thing with about... For me, you know, ball mastery and one v one domination. You know, the, the dramatic improvements we saw at Tottenham Hotspur with all the young players and the players, sort of players that came through there, uh, was was you know unbelievable in terms of you know the budget which we had compared to bigger clubs, bigger rivals in the capital, and the, and the players that we were getting in, in terms of recruitment. But so, for instance, if you look at the most successful academies in Europe statistically at the moment, that's um, Ajax and Dynamo Zagreb. Dynamo Zagreb just broke the world record of the most players in a single team at a World Cup, but so there's the CIES Observatory Statistics as the most prolific academies, uh, Ajax and Dynamo. Luckily, I've been to visit these two academies a couple of times over the last couple of years. And, you know, you see, interesting enough, ball mastery and 1v1 is a key strain of, you know, what these, these academies do. And I was really interested, actually, I was shocked, you know, every day, you know, every session with the foundation phase specifically, you know, ball mastery every session, but also 1v1. So you look at that and look for patterns and see why, you know, you know for instance, why it's so... You know, had such a dramatic effect, and also Belgium as well. You know, they it's a key part of their national uh, federations um, curriculum, and so you see. And then obviously the dramatic. So I have to say, why don't we, you know, embrace it? And the clubs, you know, that use it will tell you how how uh, 
dramatic an effect it can have. But it's frustrating because, you know, you, you bang the drum, you say, well, hang on, look at this, you look at this, this example, but people still want to go in a different direction. Yeah, just frame frame reality to what they want it to be rather than what it actually is. It's, it's, well, uh, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, I, I think it's just, it's about, you know, if you've been brought up a way or been educated a certain way of doing things, you know, like they said, you can't do, teach an old dog new tricks maybe, but, you know, if you just, if you never encountered it, if you've never been in an environment where you've seen, you know, ball mastery and 1v1 done properly, then, may, then you're not surprised you don't understand it. That's why I, I push constantly to try and get, you know the English FA to include this more prevalently in the in the uh, in our courses for our coaches, especially our elite level coaches. And I, you know, and I'm not, you know, the 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 FA courses are generally very good. They're very excellent. But I just think this is one area where they could potentially improve because, you know, if you look at you know even United under Millerstein, the effect he had on the academy there as a one v one specialist. So I know he's left. They don't really do much there anymore. So it's just so it's like you know you just need to look at the uh, the evidence that's out there. What I like about your work is that you break the the ball mastery stages into terms of age specific. So one of the things I get a little bit frustrated in terms of skill development is that I think as soccer coaches, we look upon it as like someone's good technically and they repeat the same exercises for from U6 through to U18. Your model progresses that there at every level. How have you built that? Well, it's always, you know, when we have this conversation, for me, it's like, you know, I'm not saying all work out of a game environment is good. It's about, you know, knowing when to do it and how to do it. And for me, it's about, you know, all work with the ball individually and with that out of a game context must be cognitively challenging. So you don't want players switching off and just doing it by rote. So that means, you know, once they have the skill or have the combination, you have to change it up. You have to, you know, you have to get them working at a quicker speed, quicker intensity, or different combinations. So they have to constantly think about what they're doing. That's a challenge. So you know, you work in as a as a steady progression, working through the different, you know, exercises, the different one v one skills. I mean, we have, I I personally have like eight core skills, one v one skills to work with. They're the core skills of the core movement, and then you have infinite different possibilities and variations which players can express themselves. But I mean, yeah, it's about really making sure whatever session you're doing, that players just can't switch off. And I think that, you know, maybe I've done it in the past myself sometimes. You just almost you do something, you have it, and you're maybe doing that every single time. And that's the danger of it. Like anything, like a, you know, like a passing drill where you can just pass and follow. Players switch off and you're not really maximising the outcomes of that, that particular interaction or that particular session, which is key considering we don't really have players for that um, um, large amount of time these days. Yeah, the, the most common complaint from coaches after a game, probably after blaming the ref, is that we weren't technically good enough today. But then so many then have bland passing, receiving, dribble round in a square with a ball exercises. So how important is session design and imagination when a coach is trying to improve technique? Yeah, this is really important to me as well. I mean, I often talk about trying to create more developed players with playground type playground type um, attributes so you want those playground players who are okay do things off the cuff and beat players and stay on the ball and con- you know dominate 1v1 and you know I, mean, I know a lot of people say well you can't do that in a controlled environment I say well you can do because we have done it now we've done it as Spurs and you know clubs do it around the world you know you have to be brave in what you do so I think there's a danger sometimes it's not a danger but I mean I think there's a tendency sometimes to formulize the way our players play too early especially at a younger age so we want are under eights and under nines and under tens to, to play a certain way to play like the first team. So, you know, I was very lucky when I first got my job at Tottenham. Chris Ramsey said to me, "No, I don't want a pretty game of football. You know, what I mean, I don't want all players defending the box. You know, he wants that chaos. Within the chaos, then becomes, then you get those great outcomes. But that's not saying just let them play. So it's about trying to recreate those playground environments, which you know used to play three, four hours a day, or whatever. But about getting those touches in, but in a much smaller time. So. It's about structuring that environment, working individual players on the ball, challenging them, letting them express themselves. Lots of 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, 4v4s. Those, those, you talk about session design, that's going to give you a lot more skillful outcomes. If you look at, I mean, that's, the research shows that that's true. So I think another problem within the modern age is that, you know, our under 8s, under 9s are playing 7v7 or 8v8, 9v9s. When, and, you know, in their game time, and then sometimes players, people doing that in their session. 
And what they'll give you is actually, yeah, a pretty game of football, uh, lots of one or two touch football, but not a, maybe a, not a lot of individual brilliance. Whereas if you focus more on small sided games within your sessions, 1v1, 2v2, 3v4v4s, you're going to get a lot more skillful type outcomes, a lot more skillful players. And then you go into your game on the weekend and then just treat that as another session. So, yeah, we might win, we might lose. We want to win, but it's not the end of the world that we lose because we know down the road, you know, our players are going to be technically a lot better than anyone else's in, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years, whatever. Yeah, but then again, is that that's long-term view from coaching where you're saying there, Chris Ramsey wants it to be game-like, but that in a 1v1 construct, and that's going to be mostly failures, right? Like, they're going to have to fail a lot, but then... How much of it is down to the coach being okay with the player losing the ball and then not stopping? The well, that's exactly that's why you have to create a culture within your club. So it's important to say, look, here's our eights and nines and tens, for instance. We know that's going to look a lot different between our elevens and twelves. That's going to look different between our thirteens, fourteens, fifteen, sixteen. So we say, you know, are we brave enough to say our eights and nines and eights and nines are just going to play small formatted games? A little bit chaotic. We're still going to have a structure, an elite environment. We need to challenge our players, but really it's going to be a lot more egocentric in terms of letting players stay on the ball more and make the decisions. And as they progress, and then and, and they progress individually, then we we start to see the game grow to be more realistic, and then they have to move the ball. When they, you know, obviously, when they get to eleven, like here, they're playing nine v nine. The spaces are bigger. They have to learn to share the ball more and learn to deal with bigger spaces. But it's just about having a bit more patience. I think, and saying, you know, yeah, we're willing to get turned over, you know, when we're eight and nine. It's not going to matter in terms of result, but we know as we progress in, because you know, I've been there, you know, it's a lot easier to teach players how to play one or two touch when they're 11, when they're technically excellent, whether they, when they're not. So, you know, having those players eight and nine to spend a lot more time on the ball and make mistakes and be courageous. And that's the thing, you know, when you're playing five or five and six or six, it doesn't really matter as much as, as a tight pitch because, you know, it's, People lose it when they lose it, but on a bigger pitch, you know, people may be a little bit more uh, sceptical at doing that and you know making mistakes. Yeah, we had Robbie Survey on here a, a couple of weeks ago. Robbie was worked in Japan and talked about the the Japanese players' approach to individual technique is just outrageous. They'll spend so much time doing an exercise without getting bored, but. They lack creativity when it comes to doing something different or a little bit of magic because it's just outside the box. Or would you coach that then by doing more four v four, five v five, setting it up that way? Or how how do you it's, do that? It's got, so it's got to be a balance. So you know, so you know, for me, for me, ball mastery has to be part of every session. But that's only going to be, for instance, ten minutes at the beginning of the session. So I've got so for instance, if I've got two hour session or an hour and forty five, whatever it is. 10 minutes of ball mastery, maybe five, 10 minutes of ball striking. But in terms of uh, small small numbers, ball to player ratio is always really important. So lots of rotation involved, balance, talk about key things of our philosophy, and then straight into your 1v1s and then into your 2v2s or your 4v4s. And then maybe on 5v5, stuff like that. My, you know, for me, the, the, you know, the utopian way is to do it is really not even have anything more than a 5v5 in the training sessions because that's, you talk about creativity, that's when you know you're gonna you're gonna get the the creative outcomes. Those like I said, those playground like outcomes. Players can get on the ball and do something. Because if you look at it, the top players in 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 world football, or world soccer, you know who are they? These are players who can get on the ball under pressure and then do something. Uh, you know while under pressure. So you look at Modric is a great example. One of been my one of my favourite players for years since I used to see him work when I worked at Tottenham many years ago. He was just unbelievable in terms. You know, he's a little guy, not big physically, but just so explosive on the ball, always willing to receive it, always always could stay on it under pressure and always could then, you know, have some end products as well. So that's, you talk about session design, that's what it is. That's what's so good about 1v1 uh, practices, you know, a simple 1v1 practice is that players don't have the opportunity to hide. There's nowhere to go. You've got to solve the problem yourself. And, you know, people can say to me, yeah, but I like, I like you know, I like playing 2v2 better because it's more decision-making. I say, yeah, but but the problem is just that sometimes it's about quality rather than quantity. I've said this a lot. It's about, you know, I can do that, but then I, as soon as there's an easy way out, I can get rid of it, I can move it, I can move it. Sometimes when you need to force players, you've got to stay on it, and now can you keep it? Because that's the thing, you know, the top players in the world can keep it under a bit of pressure when they're in trouble, not lose the ball. And then obviously you build it into a bigger format game. But that's what's really interesting about those, those gladiator-type practices. You know, you really challenge the players to come out and make the decisions themselves and say, yeah, I can get on it. And, you want that bravado you sort of get in the in the cages of the 
you know, in the parks, the estates, whatever you get, you know, where you, all these players come from. So I, I, I think that's a really important part and that's, that's, where you, that's where you really get those creative outcomes. Yeah, it's almost moving as well to be as, as defensive systems improve, you know, like because the range of athleticism and the defensive organisation is, is at such a high level these days, teams are, are winning the ball backs, and, uh, but it's what they do when they win the ball back now. They're in com- compact areas. So whereas a creative player was 10, 15 years ago was uh, a number 10, now everyone has to be creative to a certain extent, right? Well, this is why I say, you know, when I go into clubs and, you know, I do coach education and things like this, and, you know, we talk about the My Personal Football Coach app, a lot of clubs use it. While we use, like pro clubs, for instance, Wolves use it. And say that is that it's not, they say, you know, look at the modern day, you know, centre back. He's got to be able to get on the ball and bring it out of the fence. The the full back is now like an inverted, you know, deep lying winger. You know, you're four, you're eight, like, you know, Modericches and, those sorts of players, their players can get on it. Every position on the pitch now has to have those 1v1 qualities. And they all look different. A lot of people just associate 1v1 as that, you know, I set up a dribbling practice and me dribbling at a player five, 10 yards away. When actually, you know, the reality is that actually 1v1 practices look a lot different to that. It's about, you know, can players bring it from the back, receive it back to pressure, can they stay on it or back to the with pressure on the side or there's so many different variations. And 1v1 domination looks a lot different all around the pitch. And you look at the best players in the world, you know, the ones who, you know, who picked up the awards the other night, for instance, Ramos is really good. He can still, he's good under pressure, bring it out. You know, Modric, all those players, just that. Wherever you are in the pitch now, if you really want to be a top player, you need to be able to get on the ball and stay on the ball under pressure and then have a bit of that end product, whether it's a cross pass or a shot. Yes, the end product. So I love watching new exercises and I love people that share stuff on social media, but dribbling around a box and touching the ball 600 times without finding a pass is or a shot, does that wind you up as well? Well, it doesn't wind me up. Listen, there's lots of different ways to do things. I mean, personally, I don't like practices which are just, you know, side to side for doing the thing over and over and over again. I mean, you do it sometimes, you know, for, look, I might use skill combinations, which are, I, I do three or four or five different skills in one movement to improve movement and stuff like that. But a lot, if I'm working individually with players, you know, if I'm not, you know, if I'm not doing this, that's movement development, everything has to be explosive. So we link everything ideally with, yes, a bit of an end product, whether it's a pass or a shot or a cross. And especially when you work on old players, older players, it's got to be linked to the game. So you're saying, why are we doing it? So we might do a little you know, a bit of quick feet work in a box, but then exploding out to get down the line and whip across it or, you know, or to get into the box, I get a shot off. So it is really important. I think, you know, I'm not a big fan of things which are, are static. You know, my, the, my personal football coach program is called the Dynamic Ball Mastery Program. It's all about developing dynamic movement with the ball. And I, I, a lot, I see a lot of stuff on social media, which is just side to side, side to side, side to side, side to side. And it's just a bit boring, to be honest. So I think I'm bored. What must the player be like? And we talked about it earlier about you know, making sure it's cognitively challenging to get those quality outcomes. I'm not sure some of that is, but it might be, you know, but like I said, everyone does things differently. But yeah, for me, you know, it's important to link it to that end product and remember why we're doing it. You know, we're not trying to develop freestylers, you know, as Ricardo used to say on other Spurs, you don't, want to, you don't want a circus performer. You know, we want players who can get on a pitch and do something on the pitch. So there's got to be a method to, to, to your work at all times and link everything to the game. And I think that's, that's where sometimes people can't understand it and when some people may maybe mock the work um, clubs do. You know, we're talking about clubs like Dynamo Zagro and Ajax and people like that who work away from the game is that they don't know, they can't they don't realize you know we actually are linking it to the game and that's just a bit of an information gap i think yeah i mean i think if i think you're very short sighted if you're if you're saying that it doesn't have a place but then you you know especially in today's football because it all goes down to that moment of quality and we're, that's what we all complain about well i mean that's it you know you look at it it's that so for instance look at the england team this summer which is amazing but you still you know you you match our midfielders up to the the creation the creation midfielders for instance and you know and they weren't just when it came to the crunch we just weren't good enough on the ball under pressure we couldn't hold on to the ball so I mean if we didn't have those players who could do that and it's, I think about it a lot as well you know you talk about culture I mean Tom Bates who I, I know you know he does great work with younger players he talks about culture being key key but I think it's really interesting looking at cult, different cultures and the sort of players they produce so for instance you've got 
country like uh, Croatia, which has a tiny population, you know, in the you know, few million, and they're producing, you know, so many top quality, world class technical players. Then you have a country like England, for instance, we're doing a lot better now, 60 million, now, a huge, you know, 10 times the population. Have a country like Sweden, which has more of a similar size than to Croatia, but they have almost like a, an English way of doing things there. Technically weak players, technically weak players at the World Cup, you know, and taking Zatlan out of the, that mix, you know, don't take why you know interesting why they those Nord, those Nordic teams don't produce the same sort of technical players as uh, Croatians that sort of thing and then you have someone like the Dutch and Belgians again small population cultures of very technical footballers coming out there so it's interesting to look around the world and see you know why different cultures produce certain types of players and you know I think that's why it's lovely we're battling to things over here to try and change the culture here in England to try and support people to say, look, let's try and encourage our players to stay on the ball a bit more rather than English football has, has been quite direct or just trying to move the ball quickly all the time. Yeah, that's an interesting one because obviously having lived over here for so long now, I, I, I'm not as close to England apart from watching the football as what I used to be, but it looks to be that it's that football culture in England is now a melting pot where there's a bigger foreign influence in terms of the coaches and the players at the higher level now. Um, and then more of the other coaches, like coaches at the academy level, like yourselves, are now branching outside the country. Is that wrong? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely, look at it. I mean, we talked about, you know, Keys and Gray earlier about there. I mean, that is almost synonymous about, you know, old style dinosaurs in English football, where it's very much, this is the way we do things. We're not going to change, you know, that's success doing it. And they're right. So I think, you know, people coming into the English game, you know, the foreign coaches, whether it's Wenger, you know, Wenger having a massive impact at Arsenal, changed the way Arsenal play. And then obviously when I was at Spurs, Yol coming in and Frank Arneson, that really initiated a change in their academy there. Mourinho uh, at Chelsea. So people seeing there's different ways of doing things. You know, uh, the ball's not going forward as quick as it used to. Uh, so that people understand that players need different assets, you know, and actually we need to produce players that have the technical assets to to get into these teams that these coaches want. So you still do get players. I mean, that's, you still do get, you know, first team managers and academies who still launch it. You know, I'm not going to name any names here. And they'll, you know, they'll they'll say that they're doing it and that's fair enough. That's the way they want to do things. But, you know, I was lucky. I worked at two amazing clubs, you know, who are two of the best academies around. And it's different for those guys because they're trying to produce Champions League players. It's not necessarily about just producing players for the first team. They're trying to produce, you know, world-class Champions League players. And, those the assets you need to for that are a little bit different. You know, you need to be technically a lot better than uh, than average players. You do a lot of work in the US, um, talking about all this technical player and how to improve and the different level we can get to. Like it's it's our biggest weakness in terms of that. We we're just not producing creative players for the for the large part. Um, if you came over tomorrow and they paid you twenty million dollars a year to, to to create. What would you do? Like, how would you move a culture? What would what's your first steps? Um, it's got to be educating the the coaches and the parents. I mean, that's the main thing. So, for instance, what we were doing when we were doing stuff at Tottenham and when I was first there, no one in the country was really doing what we were doing, apart from maybe United with their four v four project, maybe. But no one in the country was really doing what they were doing, and. Even the parents can get their hands, their head around it. So you know, we were competing against you know Arsenal at the time, very much focused at the time. They were very much focused on winning and and smashing us as much as possible. Which is fair enough, but I mean, so we were just trying to say to players, parents, it doesn't matter if we lose. You know, it's all about individual technical development. Uh, you know, we're not going to be so direct. So it's the first about trying to you know obviously educate the parents, educate the coaches, and and change the culture. I mean, listen, you know, you talk about doing it there, we're still having trouble doing it here. So, I mean, you talk about, you know, America's an even bigger melting pot. And what you talked about there, there's so many different cultures there. And I mean, my, my, the little spirit, I mean, I lived in, in New, York, New York and New Jersey for a couple of years um, back in 2002, 2003, coaching out there. And even back then, and I've been over, lucky to visit. I love America, but I think there is still, I mean, a bit like here, there still is a, a tendency to, to focus on physical athleticism. Um, over individual technical excellence, maybe if I was going to generalise from what I've seen a little of it. So, I mean, it's just about trying to maybe, like I said, change the culture, which it is, it's not an easy thing, though, as you know. as you know. Yeah, but on that physical quality, so, yeah, like, so six foot five and, 
you know, I get that there in strength and power. I get that. But when you look at a Modric or a Xavi, like, do we... Do we sometimes disregard how fast these players are as well? Like they're not, they're not. Slow. Well, the problem is that we still have the problem here. I had a player who I work with who's an under nine. August birthday was 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 unsuccessful at a club, uh, a category one club. I won't name them, but they said he couldn't get around the pitch more. And all the coaches liked him. They were like, "His kid's technically amazing." Not just because I work with him, he's just technically amazing. And he's. Uh, but the, the, the person made a decision said, no, he wasn't convinced he can get around the pitch more. And that's one of the more progressive clubs. So we still have the problem here as well is that people, you know, they worry that, you know, because the physicality of the game and the dominance and they can't see the fact that, you know, you've got an eight and a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, you don't know what they're going to be like physically. You don't know. So there still was a, there still was almost revert to type. And I suppose it's less risky, isn't it? If I've got a mass six foot two guy who's going to just run a lot in a game or, or girl. You know, maybe I'm less likely to lose the game, or less likely to get embarrassed, and you know, and and and, and have problems. So, it's just I think it's a, it's about trying to encourage people more, have more of a long term view, which I think is difficult. You know, as America as in England, a competitive culture, whereas winning is really important. You know, are people really going to accept that? You know, it doesn't matter if we're going to get get beat every week at eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, or or something like that. When you work with a player of the stature of a of a young pro or an academy player um how do you balance the you know the honesty that you have with them and challenging them as well you know how do you you know i suppose how do you balance confidence and honesty it's difficult because um when i was you know still listen i can still it can still be quite it's still quite daunting going into a session for the first time with a, a, a premier league international footballer you know and you think you're right well but i mean the, the the thing is that they they want to work with me anyway. They obviously want to they want to they want to do stuff anyway. So when I was a bit younger, I, you know, it was difficult. So I sort of be you know be sort of almost um, not tender hooks, but a bit like you know, in, like a bit hesitant. But now you just got to say, look, I think this, I think that. So you know, I watched I went to a game the other night, and it's essentially now you know when you watch a game and you're watching just an individual, you know, it's a completely different experience. So you just make a note on every touch they have and every one and one one v one encounter every time they distribute the ball. So it's really about being positive. And it's like, you know, it's like anything, you have to back yourself and think, right, well, you know, I'm here for a reason and I've got to make a, I've got to make a change here. You know, I'm not going to just sit back and just do it. So say, right, let's get into it and, and, and you know, get, you know, get your hands dirty as it were. So you really got to say, okay, let's try this, let's try that and be positive and try and get your message across. And, and it's never, you know, it's never saying, look, I think you should do it this way. You should do it. I say, look, let's try this, let's try that. I think this, I watched this, I noticed that. You know, and then, you know, with a lot of the pros about just finding ways to challenge them on the ball, uh, finding different ways that they, you know, that they, if that's what they want. They just want to become, a, you know, a lot more quicker on the ball in those situations and be able to then just do it quicker on the pitch. Is there a, you mentioned earlier about how specific one of the players was about how they would like to get better. Is there a correlation between the, the higher the level of the player, the more depth they go into? Um, not necessarily. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. Some players just say, "Look, I want to get better at this." Or some players, some players will be really specific. And I work with some players that will just be working on one key thing. You know, for instance, you know, working one player says, "I'm not very good in the air. I want to get good in the air." So the whole session will be working on, you know, aerial control. So it, it does vary wildly. Some players just say, "Look, I want to get better," and they're open. And they and then they just say, "Okay, cool, we got it." You know, a lot of times it's about the young pros will do a session and then. I'll see the games and I'll say, all right, I noticed this, I noticed that. Or it's amazing as well what you pick up in a session. For instance, you know, players might have uh, something which they're not, they have, don't call it a technically inadequacy, but you may say something that they're not so strong on, for instance, you know, a certain way of delivering a ball or stuff like that. So and you can pick it up and say, right, you know, there's something we can do, there's something we can get better. So it's about, you know, working together as, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a collaboration and finding ways to just, uh, ways that they can just get, like I said, those marginal gains get a little bit better. It's like when you work with younger players, I mean, when I work with eights, nines, tens, elevens, young players or academy players, then obviously it's a lot more of a, a like, holistic approach, if you like, and it's really more about supporting all the dynamic movements and, you know, you work a lot more rounded. You won't be as specific as the position. But I mean, then as you get down, as you get older and you get into that, you know, that the, the latter stages of academy football and then pro football, then it really does become position specific and then breaking the games down into those those little key areas. Does the time change? Do you have a 
you know, does it change depending on age or player or like how, how long does a session last? Sessions are usually one hour. I mean, some people want to do more, but I, other people don't understand how physically demanding an individual session is. I mean, a lot of people say to me, a lot of people say, you know, what makes me different? I think the intensity I work, because like I said before, that even if I'm working with an eight-year-old or an 18-year-old or 28-year-old, you need to have an intensity in your work. I mean, sometimes you break things down and you're working on a bit of ball striking and stuff like that, but still, as we said earlier, it's that end product. You need to have that speed to try and replicate that game speed as much as possible. You're not in a game environment, but you, the whole point of doing this is that you're working explosively with the ball, so when you get into the game environment, you don't have to think about the ball. You know, Doug Lamoff calls talks about, you know, layering and having this almost uh, this, this, this higher level of thinking through... Um, through this this repetition of the ball, you know, he talks about it specifically. Doug Lamoff is, is practice perfect. One of the amazing books. He's one of the leaders, world leaders in education. He talks about you know the need of older players. The, the, the sometimes professional players actually need to drill more than younger players. You know, and that need to just and that's what players want. They want to come to me, do a session, and they get in the game. And they're not even thinking about the ball because it's within their subconscious. They're just doing it now. Then and and that's what you'll find a lot is that a lot of young English players, for instance. Well, a lot of players from some cultures will, you know, they're so busy fighting the ball, trying to control it, you know, they can't get their head up and then play that pass or play that one touch or whatever because they don't have that natural mastery of the ball. That's why we spend time doing the ball mastery. Whereas you look at, you know, cultures, academies that do spend more time on it, you'll notice they're so much better on the ball and they're quicker to make those decisions. And I think, you know, that's where sometimes it gets lost. People don't understand it. They say, well, uh, you know, working away from the game, it's not about decision-making. It actually is. The irony actually is about decision-making. You're actually supporting decision-making because players are able to do it because they have better control of the football. They, you know, they have better understanding of what, how it reacts to them and what they need to do with it. Is there a process that goes alongside the, the technical work as well, like in terms of your support with the player? Do you check in with them to see how the game went or how does that work? Yeah, so it depends really. I mean, so you know, luckily now I'm not involved in academy football. I have a lot more time. So, for instance, uh, I went to a Caribou Cup game last week and I'm going to go to a League Two game probably. Uh, well, I'm going away tomorrow when I come back. So, and I'll go to an academy game. So, yeah, it's about asking players how they got on. You know, and then I can, luckily I can watch some of match of the day or on TV. The others are, you know, but you need to get to a game as much as possible. So, for instance, I watched one of my clients on match of the day the other day. And, uh, you know, what you see is not always what you get. You know, you need to be there to see the live, to see the movement, how they react and all the things going on. So as much as possible, I'll try and get to games and see uh, my clients play. That's got to be decent. The match of the day music coming on and then you're thinking, right, got to work here. <laughs> yeah, it's, like I said, it's different because um, it just changes the, your, what your, changes the way you watch a game, change your whole experience. Because just literally watching that one plan and you know that plan might go to pitch and I don't care now <laughs> it's like I'm clocking off almost it's just it's, 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 an, it's an unusual uh, sensation unusual feeling but you know so you know what you do brilliant um, last few for you if you know as a club coach listening to this or high school coach and you're thinking right well it's just me on my own and I want to develop technically better players you know how, how do you help them so it's about consistency. So like I said, you know, in the team session, you know, if you've, got, if you've only got an hour, just do the first 10 minutes of your session, the individual ball work. It's got to be individual as well. You know, if possible, one ball each. If you haven't, you can work one ball between two or three or four, but you need to get those individual outcomes with the ball and ideally a bit of going into a bit of 1v1 as well. That's how you, real, you really will see the, the change in your players if you get in that consistency, whether you're doing it one day a week or if you're lucky to work two, three days a week. Do a little bit every session and then obviously set them homework as well. So, you know, especially if you've got them once or twice a week, set them little technical challenges that they can do away. I mean, that's what my personal football coach, the app is, it's, you know, homework programs. The players can say, right, coaches say, look, okay, do that, do this. And they're confident their players can go away and do it because just like anything, you know, especially if you want to develop elite players, you know, they need to be doing a little bit, every, even if it's a little bit every day. That's what my personal football coach is. It's just 20 minutes a day of extra technical work then it's about, it's about quality rather than quantity. They can get that important work in and then the coach can concentrate on his team play and his session. But it, it's, the important thing is to just make sure it's about consistency and having that regular contact uh, with the ball, with the players. And, and you'll see the outcome. You'll see the benefits. You know, you, you just you don't take my word for it. Like I said, you know, check out what the 
the, the best academies in world football are doing and, and this is what they're doing. Yeah, the app is it's pretty spectacular what you've done with the app. You've got the resources for the player, but you've also got resources for parents and coaches as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously the app just started as a, like I said, it's a homework program for players and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so the individual homework players, five to sevens program, eight to elevens, 12 to 16s, 17 plus, but something for every age group. Uh, the, the, we have, obviously we're working with clubs a lot as well and the feedback we got from clubs is, look, we love this, the, the players are all doing this technical work, but how do we uh, integrate that into the session? So that's the coaches pass, which is like the online resource for coaches really came for that. And that's really, then that's a, a library of ball mastery skills, 1v1 techniques, uh, a, a large hundreds of videos on their library, but also uh, in the, like team practices as well. So we have like uh, 1v1 practices, lots of technical practices on there. So the idea is that, you know, if you if we talk about consistency, you know, we're, we're encouraging our players to use 1v1 skills and do 1v1s in 1v1 practices, then having some team sessions as well, which I can then introduce that into my um, into the team session. So that's going really well. We've got obviously Wolverhampton Wanderers use it as a, they're a club partnership to use it for the foundation phase. Uh, we've got clubs in America, Canada, England, Australia, Thailand, all around the world. So the club partnership, the My Personal Football Coach club partnership is developing and it's good. We just literally just finished a plug-in now, which uh, where pl- the, the club can log in themselves and they can check the data of the players. So the, the, the club manager can check in and say who's using it, when they've been using it, how long they've been using it, but also what they can do as well now is that they can they can set the uh, players' individual challenges themselves. So the, the, the app basically is like a, a 30 session uh, course, 30 different individual sessions which are broken up into videos, seven or eight videos, very easy to follow, you know, idiot proof. But now the club can actually say, well, actually this week I want you to do number eight or number six and actually through our new back end, our plugin can set individual challenges. So yes, yeah, I'm really proud of it, really happy with it. I mean. We're going really well, uh, so it's just about now trying to support clubs to get um, to get on board and help you know to help develop their players and their coaches. Um, and, and just quickly go, you mentioned about parents there. I mean, parents is really important as well. I think you know a lot of the people who come to my personal football coach are parents who want to support their kids, whether they're a beginner or a elite player. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily have that 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 experience in their background. You know, they can go to mypersonalfootballcoach.com, download the app, and they can, you know, have a world-class coaching, uh, uh, you know, world-class coaching course for their for their children, whatever age, whatever level, and you know, know this is something which has been proven at the highest level. So, it's, I mean, that's been really powerful as well. Yeah, there's a way bigger need for that than, I mean, there's uh, every every coach I'm sure would nod their head that they've drove past the park or drove past the field and seen someone with an individual coach doing stuff that would make you shake your head. So it's good for them to get a bit of guidance to, because kids aren't, they're not, this generation is just not conditioned enough to go out and train by themselves, are they? Well, that's the point. I mean, also it's like, you know, look at what kids engage with, they engage with apps, they engage with things on phones. First of all, you need to give them, you know, a medium that they can relate to. So, you know, the five to sevens programs come out recently. That's one of our most successful programs and people keep posting uh, tagging me on Twitter if they're you know they're five six or seven year olds just engaging on the iPad doing it themselves and looking at the skills and trying the skills and setting up the practice themselves so that's really important so it's about you know having something where parents have a bit of guidance you can support players in doing that and it, and you know whether it's you're you're at an elite level or you're at a beginner level it's really important to try and develop that intrinsic mechanism to work away from the game work hard go go practice what I need to improve on you know whatever it is whether I'm not very good at maths or not either. I need to go away and practice and be better. So any sport you need, that's a really important uh, attribute to have and being able to do that. And also, you know, in the modern day as well, like coaches who uh, have less time with their players and they need to work on those really important game-like practices, you know, that's where there's something like this is really powerful as well. They can say, okay, we've got this, you know, we've only got an hour a week or two hours a week. We can do our team training, but then we can set the players away to do their technical work individually and I know that they're doing it and if they're not doing it obviously I can check and and chase them up and you know so that's that's why it's really powerful as well yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with the technology side like we, we have to sell this this love of the game to young kids and when I look back as we all do we look back at how someone sold like my dad sold the love of the game to me but he probably did it by yeah he took me to games and he kicked the ball around with me but he also bought me 
bucket loads of videos that I sat in front of the TV for. So that was technology 30 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I watch it like, I used to be obsessed with Peter Beardsley. Like, he's one of my favourite players. And I used to watch how he play and copy his skills and you know, watch TV and then go and try and recreate them with my mates in the park, down that sort of thing. And, you know, so that's how kids learn. You know I mean, how, you know, living vicariously and seeing other people, what they do stuff on TV, the stars and, you know, their skills or seeing what their skills of friends do in. So... It's like I say, you know, we don't live in a we don't live in a society anymore where we go kids go down the park and play two, three hours a day like we used to maybe, and you know we spend hours on the ball individually. So we don't have that. We're not we don't have that luxury maybe with our young players. So we need something we can say, right, go and do twenty minutes of this. This is how you get the high quality technical outcomes, and then go and do your other homework or go and do this and that. And we we all know how how um you know how 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 busy young people are these days in you know in Western culture specifically about going from here to there to this class to that class and juggling what they've got to do. So I think that's why it's so important to have, like, you know, to have something which is really about, you know, this, we need 20 minutes to get this 20 minutes done and you're guaranteed to become a better player. All right, last one for you. How does a coach with a focus on individual development, how do you look to get better? You mentioned uh, about looking at some other sports, ice hockey, going to places like Holland and... I mean, what, what's the what's the process that you kind of involve getting better? So, I mean, for my own CPD, I mean, obviously I've got my podcast, you know, the, the My Personal Coach podcast, that really came out of me wanting to learn and get better. So I'm really fortunate I speak to a lot of people and through that I've been able to visit clubs. For instance, in the last couple of years, I've been to Ajax, I've been to uh, Dynamo Zagreb, um, I'm going to be visiting a few other big academies in the next few months. That's really important. I was, went down to QPR the other day just to visit Chris Ramsey, who's like, you know, obviously we mentioned him earlier, a big mentor of mine, and just to watch him again to get inspired. So it's about trying to go to go to places where they have a culture which is similar to mine or have a philosophy which is similar to mine, which is my like Ball Marshall 1v1, which are those academies like Ajax and Dynamo, which I mentioned, and there's, there's lots of them like that, and trying to uh, go in there and see coaches work and... And and there are people like obviously Tom Bayer, he's a great person, he's good work, he's he's very inspirational. And there's a, you know, there's so it's about trying to this uh, you know, Michelle Riberio who works at Kansas now, he's a skills coach, he's a bit gank. So there's there's people about, you know, so it's just about going and like any coach you wanna go and watch people and learn learn from the best and then try and strive to improve yourself. But it is really important because, you know, like anything, you can you do risk maybe just doing things one way and carrying on is really important. So, I mean, for instance, you know, when I left Spurs, which was, for me, it was amazing. You know, it was an unbelievable experience. I was going to Tottenham, what an amazing academy. I went to Chelsea and they had a different way of doing things. And to begin with, mate, I was a little, probably if I was honest, a little bit resistant to it because I was very much, we do this this way. And it took me a while to adjust there. But then you, you see the benefits of the way other things are done. And I, I, I grew massively as for my time at Chelsea because I learned so much there and working in that world class environment and seeing things done slightly different, it really opened my eyes and improved me because, you know, I think you can that's the benefit of what having experience of working at a different club because people might not realise that, you know, all the clubs in London have quite different philosophies. Uh so it's quite good to go there and it opens your eyes and think, Wow, you know, actually there is other way to do it. So that's really important as well to see people doing things uh differently. I'm sure there's a coach who's who's listening who is, you know, more connected to individual development. That's more in a way that they maybe want to go or something they're a little bit more interested in. What what advice would you have for someone who's who's drawn to that side of the game more? Um, I'd say, like, do your homework. Look at look at academies who 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 work in that sort of way. Look at skills coaches. You know, there's some great ones around the world, and try and follow them and see their work and we now have things like YouTube which is unbelievable which you can get all sorts of stuff on you can see coaches working in these environments but I mean um, there's stuff like Chris Ramsey working that sort of thing and, and try and see people you know I remember you know what my first time going to Tottenham was like a was like a culture shock it was amazing like the the, the difference between going into that elite environment and then come from grassroots football was like night and day it was amazing you know the real and you real bet it's a sink or swim environment you really got to get yourself sorted and get into that so if, you, if you're lucky enough you can get into the, those elite academy environments or even first team environments go and do it because it's a different world you know people don't think people understand the, the, the difference working with elite players and the intensity and 
the quality and the explosiveness and the dynamism and every day you see there. So I think that's really important as well. It's a big uh, jump up. So if you're lucky enough, go and go and see and keep on learning and and try and be a master of your craft and a student of the game, if you want to call it that. First class. So thanks very much. Enjoy Thank you very that. Much, guys. It's been Thanks so much to Saul for his time and his insight there. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I would urge you to, to check out his work, um, check out his website, check out his app, his social media. Definitely listen to his podcast. It's absolutely brilliant. But I followed Saul for a, for a few years now and I'm a big, big fan of his work. As you can see from, from listening to him, he's really, really passionate about development. He asks a lot of questions. But for me, I can see why players go to him. I can see why he's been so successful because he's constantly looking to adapt his work to the need of the players and the need of the games. But I look at a lot of his social media stuff. Nothing's ever the same. He's always putting dynamic stuff together. It's never bland sessions. And I think that's what players need. I think that's what everyone's game is different. So when a person comes to you for individual skill development, you have to put something together that that player needs and it may well be touching the ball more times or it could be a final product issue or it could be something tactical that you could help with. And then can you extend that then? Can you open up the conversation where Saul's going to watch them play? Saul's taking a, an interest in what they're doing um, and he's fully engaged in the whole process rather than just working with them for half an hour. So there's a lot of good stuff with that there. I'm going to team up with Saul in the near future so we'll have some news about that too so please stay tuned we'd love to hear your thoughts on it always always like i said at the start of the podcast the individual skill development piece it gets a lot a lot of opinion going on social media i think players should be doing it like i said in one of his questions um i think that players should have their own coach i think players should be doing way way more uh, beyond team practices and in today's game it's not natural that they are outside doing training or extra work so if it takes them to go and get a coach to help them I am 100% behind it but if they're going to do that you may as well get them quality instruction you may as well go deep into the game you may as well start educating them well beyond what technique is and try to help them out in performance and other areas as well so yeah i think it's it's well needed but i also think that there's a there's a difference between a personal skills coach and a really 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 good personal skills coach uh, that's just my opinion so again something we're going to look at in these podcasts individual development what does it mean how do we make it more specific how do we individualize it more uh, and we'll, we're going to look at, at digging a little bit deeper into this topic and hopefully getting the conversation flowing online too so as always we'd love to hear your thoughts on it please 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 give me a shout on twitter gary at gary kernine on instagram at gary kernine email gary at modernsoccercoach.com always 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 love hearing from coaches hearing what what you agreed with what you didn't agree with uh, what you'd like to hear more from but i always i, I love hearing coaches uh, reach out and always appreciate you promoting the podcast and spreading the word so thanks so much for listening look forward to hearing from you and talk soon bye thank you for listening to the modern soccer coach podcast for more coaching topics sessions and resources head on over to coach kernine on facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com